Hello, this is Cecilia with Kentucky Rose Devotionals, where we're finding the roses in the Word of God. Sorry that I've missed you again for a few days. Uh, just been a busy time, but I thank God for for being busy working for Him. So I thank God for that. Um, but I, I want to be more faithful um, coming to you with these devotions. So uh, please just be in prayer for me. Um, I have uh, many hats that I have to wear right now, so just, just uh, keep me in your prayers. Keep our family in your prayers. We want to just be available servants for the Lord's use. And so um, we are I have been in the book of Jude, and we made it so far. I think we made it to about um, verse 16 and 17, and we stopped there. But I just want to kind of go back and, and look at some of the thoughts that we see in this little, this little book that is full of so much wisdom. And, of course, we know, again, I'm just going to review that Jude is the half brother of Jesus, um, and the brother of James, obviously, is is what he mentions here. James, the other half brother of Jesus, both of them um, gave their lives for the gospel, um, and they shared um, Jesus with all those who would listen. And you know that's what Jude was asking in this letter for others to do: to be sincere, to be genuine in your sharing of the true gospel, not to add to it, not to take away from it, because when you do that. You distort the gospel, but to continue in staying true to the Word of God, sharing the Word of God with others. And that's really what Jude was, was sharing through this epistle. And a lot of the things that are here are not easy to to um, to take, to be honest. There's a lot of things that, that he addresses that are uncomfortable topics for most people. But these are the topics that we have to address if we want to grow and know that we are right with God, that we are in, in a position where we can worship and serve God and not only just worship and serve Him but be in a position to receive from Him because our lives are clean and that we don't have sin and abomination in our life. So sin we know brings corruption and those were the things he was telling us through this this little letter. Um, he was he, he went back to Cain. He mentions Cain. He mentions Balaam. He mentions Korah. These are all different spirits that we could see. Spirits of rebellion. Um, spirits of empty offerings. You know Cain offered an offering that was empty. It was not his first offering. It was not his best offering. And so we want to be careful about those things you know we want to be careful that we give God our very best that we surrender everything to him giving everything over to him first as we give everything over to him first then comes the blessings that we receive by that total surrender of giving God everything and you know sometimes it's so easy to get so busy and so distracted with the doing that we lose sight of really what the true mission that is to worship Jesus, to serve Him with our life, to win souls to the kingdom of God. That comes before anything else. Everything else is, as as I've been teaching on Wednesday nights at our church, everything else Paul said is done compared to knowing Christ. Everything. So um, that spirit of Balaam, that's the spirit of greed he talked about. The spirit of Korah, the spirit of rebellion. So all of these spirits, you know, when we if we notice these things in our lives, we need to eradicate it. We need to get it out of our life. We need to kill it. And the only way to kill it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, this self-serving attitude he talked about. He said that the, about the clouds with no water being useless, basically. Um, and he was saying how astonishing it was that people were being deceived by these people that were coming in to the church and pretend, pretending. Be, and, and what we would call that today is hypocrites. People who live one life on the outside of the church, but in the uh, inside the church, they act a total different way. We don't want to be those. We don't want to be these people that he mentions here at verse 16. The grumblers, the complainers, walking in their own lust. So as we as we start here and we finish out this this precious little book, I'm just going to start at, at 17 because I think that's a great place to start. And it says, But you, beloved, remember. Who's beloved? The church. We are to be... The, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We're to be the body of Christ. We're to be representatives of heaven here on earth to those around us. Representatives of Jesus with our lives. You know, and that's the evidence. You know, the evidence that you belong to Christ is the way you live your life, the way you speak, the way you talk to people, the way you treat people, the way you show genuine care and love and kindness. 
if you're not showing those things, if those are not those fruits aren't being exhibited in you, then you really don't know Christ as well as you think you do. You know, this is something we all have to deal with every day. We have to crucify that flesh daily. How do we crucify it? We put it under the blood of Jesus. We walk in the precepts of Jesus every single day, walking in His Word, reading His Word, absorbing His Word. Uh, David said to meditate. He meditated in the Lord, meditated in his heart. That means he rehearsed the Word of God over and over in his mind, and he let it penetrate into his heart and his spirit. So he says, remember. How can you remember something? First, you have to learn something to remember it, don't you? So if, if we want to remember the Word of God, we got to read the Word of God. Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles, our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying, review the words of those who've walked with Jesus. Those who walked with Jesus were the apostles. We're not going to meet modern day apostles today. Apostles were those who followed Jesus and were chosen by Jesus specifically at that time. All of us today would be classified that, that follow Jesus as disciples. So there's a big difference. Apostle was specifically chosen by Jesus himself while he was on the earth. A disciple is a person like you and like me who are followers of Jesus Christ in this present day. So anybody who came after the apostles who didn't specifically be chosen by Jesus himself will be considered a disciple. There were many disciples that had come after the apostles, okay? Apostles, when we say Apostle Paul, well, you say, well, Jesus was already crucified by then. But Jesus came down to him and chose him, spoke to him, blinded him on that road that day. So he is an apostle. So those are just some things that sometimes people get mixed up to think that there's present day apostles. No, apostle was chosen specifically by Jesus. Now, when we become disciples of Jesus, Jesus has chosen us specifically, but he didn't come down um, from heaven. And, and take on his earthly form again to choose us. So that's just kind of the difference that we have there when we use the word apostle and disciple. He says, how they told you that they would be mockers in the last days. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. When we make a decision for Christ, don't expect your life to immediately just turn around and everything to be roses. It's not going to be that way. He's telling them, as you serve Christ, as you live for Christ, you are going to encounter people that will mock you, that will ridicule you, that won't even want to have anything to do with you, won't talk to you. I've experienced that in my, my life, probably uh, really all of my life since I was a young girl. Um, I got saved when I was eight. I got filled with the Holy Ghost when I was 16. And I can remember wanting to be what, what was taught, sanctified, set apart for the use of God. Being set apart mean, meant I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't want to wear certain things that other people wore. And that was for me. Those were convictions that I had that I wanted to look a certain way to be set apart as to be known as a disciple of Christ. If you do everything the world does, you can't be set apart. You can't be sanctified when you're doing everything that is unholy and un unsanctified. Okay? So that's what he was telling here. Don't be surprised. That when you make a decision for Christ, that you're mocked, that you're ridiculed, that you're mistreated. Because this world is going to make fun of you because they're walking in their own lust. They're walking in their own way. And as a child of God, we don't walk that way. We're not to walk according to our flesh. If we do what our flesh wants us to do, we'll hurt people. We can cause harm to ourselves. So he's telling us, don't walk the way that the world walks, but instead walk by the Spirit. He tells us at verse 19, these are sensual persons, people that are only concerned about if it feels good. Have you heard the saying, if it feels good, do it? Well, there's some people that just live by that. They do whatever feels good to them, and they don't, they don't care about anybody else's feelings. This is not the way of a Christian. This is not the way of a disciple of Jesus Christ. We don't do what feels good. In fact, most of the time, what we do doesn't feel good. It hurts, it, and there's suffering, and there's pain involved with it because we're partaking in the suffering with Jesus Christ. But in that suffering, there's unexplainable joy. There's unexplainable peace. 
This is, this is what we receive in exchange for giving up the things of this world, for going through suffering, for walking with Christ. We get something that the world cannot understand. We get peace of mind. We get joy in our heart. Okay, all of these things. Yes, it's, it's quite a, 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 quite a trade-off that we get from the Lord when we serve Him. Yes, there's suffering involved. But in that suffering, God gives us supernatural strength through the Spirit. That doesn't, he says at verse 19, it doesn't cause division, but instead it brings us together through the Spirit, through the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Verse 20, he says, But you, beloved, again, the church, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. How do you do this? He tells us how. Praying in the Holy Spirit. If you don't pray in the Holy Spirit, begin to do that. You say, well, I don't have the Holy Spirit. How do I receive it? It is just a gift. You have already received a portion of the Holy Spirit when you got saved. So the Holy Spirit's already there. He's already dwelling. But we've got to activate Him to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit gives us a comforter, discerner, gives us wisdom, gives us power, boldness, strength to overcome. It gives us power to, to read the Word of God and understand it. That is the power of being Holy Ghost filled. So I would encourage you to seek for the Holy Spirit. It is a gift. So we just seek and we ask for it. But the first requirement is salvation. We have to start there. We have to ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us, to heal us. Uh, Lord, I repent of my sin. Lord, I come to you today. I ask you to cleanse me. Lord, I believe that your son died on the cross for me. That he rose again on the third day. And that because of him now, I have new life. Lord, I accept that new life that you give to me today. I, I'm going to live in it. I'm going to dwell and abide in what your son, Jesus Christ, did for me. When you say that prayer and you ask forgiveness of your sin, then now you're a candidate for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's already there. He's already indwelling in you. But we have to ask for that gift. We say, Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would give me the gift. And the evidence, the evidence of being filled is going to be the evidence of speaking in unknown tongues. What are these unknown tongues? The, the Word of God in Acts chapter 2, look up Acts chapter 2, tells us that these cloven tongues of fire sat on all these men that were filled with the Holy Spirit that day in the upper room. This was not something just for olden days. It's for today. We can speak in tongues. We can speak to the Lord in our prayer language. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. We can talk to Him. We can pray according to the will of God. Isn't that a wonderful empowerment that Jesus gave us? So, you know, He said, I will send you a comforter. When He went back, to heaven. He said, you'll know that I made it because I send you the Holy Spirit as a comforter. And so today, if you don't have it, start seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Start seeking for more power, more discernment with the Lord. And He will give it. He will supply your need if you seek Him. So let's go on. Build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. We need to pray daily. Hallelujah. We need to stay in the Spirit. Keeping yourselves, he says, in the love of God. Oh, how important that is. Love your neighbors. Love your family. Show them the love of Jesus. Jesus said that, you know, we'll know you. You'll know that you belong to me by the love that you exhibit to others around you. Love them. Even when they don't love you. Even the unlovable. We must love them through Christ. Doesn't mean we have to approve of their sin. Doesn't mean we have to approve of things that they're doing that are wrong. Doesn't even mean we have to run with them and go the places that they go. But we need to love their soul and we need to love them enough to pray for them to see God deliver them. Um, so this is very important. Looking for the mercy. Always looking for mercy. Err on the side of mercy. Show people mercy. Show people the love of Jesus. Show them that God is a God of second chances and third chances and fifteenth chances. Show them that God is merciful through how you treat them. You know, instead of talking, I mentioned this Wednesday, and um, a brother came to me after the service and said, you know, I think what you were saying is that instead of telling people about hell, live in a, in a way that your life will lead them to heaven. And this is so true. You know, instead of talking to people about all the bad. And yes, hell is real. And yes, heaven is real. But we should live in a way that makes people want to strive to go to heaven. That we're leading, leading them to heaven by the way we behave, by the way we act, 
by the things that we say in our encounters with people. That is so important today. So let's look, look to that. Look to the mercy of the Lord. Err on the side of mercy. Always see the good in people. Think the good of people instead of thinking the bad. Because most of the time when we're thinking bad thoughts or we're thinking someone is against us, most of the time those thoughts are untrue. And most of the time those thoughts come from Satan. Most all the time. We might as well say. Any bad thought comes from Satan. It's going to come from him. Because he is out to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus has come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And that's the kind of power that we need to operate in. That's the kind of personality that we need to have. That we're quick to forgive. That we're merciful. That we're gracious. That we, we see the good in people instead of immediately thinking the bad. He also says here um, to look to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We keep our focus on heaven. Keep your mind on heaven. Don't let other things distract you. On some, he said, have compassion, making a distinction, but others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. In other words, you know, there are going to be people who will mock. There are going to be people who will bring division. But build yourself up in the faith. Pray in the Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God. Look for mercy only in Christ. And have your heart and mind fixed on eternity. Not the present. Not the past. But fix your eyes on the eternity. The eternal goal of what's happening around you. And then he says... Powerful scripture here, verse 24. Glory be to God. Now to him, now unto God, who is able to keep you from stumbling. He is able to keep you from stumbling. We can't keep ourselves from, from failing, but God can. Hallelujah. To present you faultless. This is what Jesus will do for you. He will present you faultless before the Father one day because of the blood that you accepted over your heart and over your life, his blood. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. This is what we had to look forward to. To God our Savior who alone is wise. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. The Holy Spirit is in complete control of our heart and our life if we allow him to be today. So I would encourage you, let the Holy Spirit lead and guide you, direct you. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, then get filled. Get full of Him. Start seeking for it. Start finding you a Holy Spirit filled church. Find a place where the Holy Spirit is free to operate. Not in chaotic operation, but in gentleman operation, which is what what Holy Spirit does. He is a gentleman. He operates in order. He operates um, in those who are willing to yield themselves to Him. Totally surrender. Totally submitted unto Him. When we submit our tongue, we submit our heart, our, our mind, our body, our spirit to the Lord. He's going to give us an infilling like we've never had before. So I would just encourage you today. Stay in God's Word. Stay in the Spirit. Stay with your faith built up in Jesus and who he is and what he's done for you not what you've done but what he has done for you he's already made a way so all you have to do today is simply cry out to him and say Lord I need your help Lord I need you to fill me to overflowing today so that that overflowing can flow out to my family members and I can see mighty works done in your name if you have not yet liked, shared, or subscribed to our channel, please hit that little button up there, that little bell, and subscribe. We'd love to have you join us on this journey. God bless you, and I will see you very soon.